All right, welcome folks. It's it's nice to see you. It's nice to have one more class in the Gompa, but we will, as Christina said, we'll continue online for another month. So that'll be quite nice. We'll make sure we get through all six perfections. Um, we're up to patience, you know, so brace yourself. But before we get into it, let's just revive our bodhicitta motivation. Sangye chudon sogi chunam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yan ki pe sonam ki rola penjia sangye rupa sho sangye chudon sogi chunam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yan ki pe sonam ki rola penjia sangye Sangye Drupa Shu Sangye Churum Sogi Churam La Janchu Padu Dani Kapsu Chi Dagi Churn Yan Ki Pe Sonam Ki Rola Penche Sangye Drupa Shu We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the pratamoksha, bodhisattva, and tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience, not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii, for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagajuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so now just sitting with that refuge in Bodhicitta, we go for refuge until we're enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly by our merits from giving and other perfections May we become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. And just letting that motivation settle in. Okay, so just to clarify, perfection or paramita are aspirations and activities directed towards achieving Buddhahood. So you see these words like generosity, patience, et cetera, and they're all very commonly understood words colloquially. But when we're talking about them in this context, we're talking about a bigger, deeper motivation, which is doing them for this long-term goal of complete enlightenment. And then as a side effect, all of our temporary stuff will get achieved as well. But it's, it's starting with the big picture rather than just starting with getting through the day and orienting in that big picture way puts everything in the correct context and the correct proportion. And it really helps ease the mind 
as well as help you have momentum so that all the good stuff you do in the day isn't kind of lost to, oh, well, that was a good day. Tomorrow's a bad day. It's not getting lost. It's all in a framework of this is my spiritual path. And life takes on a lot more meaning, even if you have the most ordinary day. So it's an orientation. It's an intention. It's a motivation. And um, it's what we really aspire to as Mahayana practitioners. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> Teresa's bringing me water. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're up to patience, and patience is forbearance with suffering. Perfecting patience means that you simply complete your conditioning to a state of mind where you have stopped your anger and the like. And just the whole premise that you're going to stop your anger is going to freak us out. Yeah, as Westerners, as modern people, anger being considered negative and stopping it, both of those concepts are very triggering. So notice that and try and hear it with fresh ears. When we say anger, we mean the wish to harm. We're not talking about being upset. Yeah, so that's really important. When you hear anger spoken about in Buddhism and why anger is never justified, understandable, but not justified, we're talking about the wish to harm. Okay. Um, and then to stop anger, it's not about suppression. It's not about denial. It's not about avoidance. You're not gaslighting yourself. When we say stop anger, we mean don't respond to suffering with the intention to harm. Yeah. So you have your suffering, whether it's quote from a person or from a situation, but your response to that isn't wish to harm. Okay, so I think, I think we're all on the same page with that, but just to make sure we're using words in a way that um, isn't just our old way prior to Buddhism. Um, so from that, then we get these really beautiful quotes from beings like Shantideva who say, unruly beings are as unlimited as space. They cannot possibly be overcome. But if I overcome thoughts of anger alone, this will be equivalent to vanquishing all foes. Where would I possibly find enough leather with which to cover the surface of the earth? But wearing leather just on the soles of my shoes is equivalent to covering the earth with it. Likewise, it is not possible for me to restrain the external course of things, but should I restrain this mind of mine, what would be the need to restrain all else? So this is incredibly powerful. It's poetic. And then you say, easier said than done, right? Or you say, restrain this mind of mind and don't worry about external things. Isn't that being complacent? Isn't that ignoring the climate crisis? Isn't that ignoring social issues? Isn't that being kind of in a, I don't know, hippie in a cave, just kind of avoidance? These are the sort of questions that'll come up. You think, yes, of course protect my mind, then I won't be so triggered. But don't worry about external course of things at all. Seems like too much. It seems like you're being too separate from kind of everyday reality, right? So when you read verses like this, hear the deeper uncontrolled reincarnation, the external manifestations of that, you cannot fix it. You can only fix the cause of it, which is our own mind under the influence of ignorance, karma, disturbing emotions, because samsara is our untamed aggregates. So you hold that knowing, and then you add to it. However, I have lots of symptoms of my samsara all around me. I do need to manage symptoms, but if my main priority is symptoms management, I never go to the cause. I never uproot the disease. So it's a shift of priorities. You're not saying I can't be a good you know, social justice worker. You're not saying I can't be a good environmentalist. You're not saying recycling is nonsense, although some places it just goes in the rubbish, you know that. But you know what I mean? Like you're not saying you can't be externally aware. It's saying, don't start there. Don't start with trying to fix everything around you. Start with fixing your own reactivity. Because if you can adjust your own reactivity, your life wisdom is right there for you. 
everything you've learned, Buddhist or otherwise, it's right there. As soon as you're agitated, you lose focus, you lose creativity. You don't want to collaborate. You just go straight to lizard brain. Yeah, you go straight to fight and flight and, you know, fawn and freeze and all of the trauma responses, which are totally natural and are completely worth compassion. But that's not where we want to live our whole life in a trauma response. We also don't want to live our whole life in a hedonistic, let's just try and make this bearable, you know, and putting throw cushions in our prison cell. You know, we want to get out. So when you read words like this from people like Shanti Deva, don't hear it as, you know, like a wrist slap, like you're not allowed to be an activist or that you're not somehow supposed to be engaged in society. It's saying, start with you, deal with you. And then from there, you're going to be a lot more impactful with whatever external choices you make. You're not going to be kind of flurrying around being busy, busy, busy with a million things that are sort of helpful and have limited effect. You're going to be a lot more precise. You're going to make choices that are more powerful. And it might be that it's fewer things that you do. Your life might get externally less busy. But I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah, busyness is not like a criteria for virtue. Okay. So when we're looking at these teachings, just kind of bear that in mind. It's not... Um, completely go to your cave. It's that go to your inner cave so that you can come out of your cave with the right headspace. So we were looking at like patients with people first, and then now we're going to look at patients with suffering, like mental suffering, physical pain, these kinds of things. But when we were talking about patients with humans, when they are the condition that triggers the rage or triggers the impatience or the sadness or the depression, what are the ways to get us out of that? And um, we ended the class with this reflection where you ask yourself, okay, what's the scenario where you're grumbly? Yeah, the grumbly scenario. Don't pick your worst enemy or your worst trauma. Just pick something that was like aggravating, okay? And then we took an example of something that was kind of aggravating and we asked ourselves, where did the harm come from precisely? Was it the action? Was it the person that did the action? Was it the affliction that motivated them to do that action? Was it the suffering that triggered their affliction? Was it the ignorance that propelled their past action that is ripening as suffering now? That innate ignorance that we all have. Is it your past negative karmic seed ripening as suffering? Hint, yes, <laughs> right? Is it your association with the current conditions current conditions being whatever they did that you drew kind of drew a frame around and said this now has significance in my life as opposed to all these other things that were happening in your life which could just as easily gotten a frame drawn around them and said no that's significant but you were the one that drew the frame so your response to the current conditions had a huge impact and you so you look at all of these and you come to the conclusion that well all of those things were a factor in feeling pain but I usually pick just one and blame that and give it all the power. And usually the thing I blame is the thing I have the least control over, which is the other person. Yeah. Instead of choosing to place control where it actually lives, which is your own management with your relationship to conditions. How do you hear words differently? How do you train yourself to hear words differently? How do you train yourself to say, when I hear angry words, that means they are struggling. It doesn't mean I am bad. <laughs> it doesn't mean fight them. <laughs> it means they're going through something. Otherwise, they wouldn't be such a jerk. Yeah. Happy people are not mean, usually. And if they are, it's usually accidental. It's so basic, but you have to remind yourself that you know this. Otherwise, it won't stick. Yeah. So you just really think, is it ever one thing? No. Can you actually reconcile the wish to harm with actual logic? You think this thing hurt me, so I'm going to, you know, smack up against it. But is there actually any logic in that? 
there's kind of an instinctual response, but that's not logic. How often are we actually under physical threat as opposed to what our nervous system gets all hyped up to think is the case? So that's what we talked about last time. And so you've had a week to let it brew. Um, did you have thoughts about that when you're just trying to manage your own reactivity when someone is really doing the wrong thing or is doing something really unforgivable to you based on your core values? How to not react with that grumble, that irritability that can escalate into this, uh, you must be punished, even if the way I punish you is just being passive aggressive and not talking to you. <laughs> How do you stop that mess? Yes, I um, had kind of a, a realization that like what was going on within me. Um, and when I realized what that was, I was able to have a much more precise conversation with that person. And it was a really rewarding conversation. Like that person really appreciated it. Um, and I feel like we've like we elevated our relationship, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Patience can make you fearless, right? When you're, yeah. when you are sort of have your mind under control, you can be very bold about saying, here's the thing that happened. Can we talk about it? But when you're all wound up, it is, it's like scary to have the talk. So managing your patience gives you such courage. Yeah. Yeah, Eve, did you want to add? Sure. Um, I, I, what I notice is a lot of my anger with intention to harm it com it comes out sar as sarcasm. So it's words that hurt. And it can take me two to three days to get off of that high horse. And <laughs> so I'm learning to sit with it. Um, until I, and you know, it's just a little process that I have to do over and over again, but, you know, starting with the possibility that I could be different, you know, where I'm coming from as a response, um, that sinks in. So I, I think it's very effective if you give it time. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a while to train yourself out of being kind of proud of yourself for getting a zinger in, you know? Even if it's just a little zinger in your mind of, ah, I know a fancy thing I could say to them that would put them in their place. And you don't even say it, but you're delighted that you came to that. You're like, <laughs> I showed them. <laughs> like, what did you show them? <laughs> and, and what's so interesting is we have this like secret teenager inside of us that thinks somehow if we say the precise sarcastic thing that shows them how foolish they've been, that that will somehow make them less foolish, right? Like if we really get them, that they'll either be put in their place and leave us alone or come to some new understanding or something good will come of it. When of course, what happens is they just feel wounded, which will make them even worse behaved, you know? But we're delighted to have gotten, gotten a jab in, you know? And so, so it takes a while to kind of train ourselves out of that because of course, so much of what we find funny in life is someone that we don't like being put in their place. Yeah, we find that funny, like in comedy or sitcoms or whatever it is that, that sort of gives us some delight. We pick some whipping boy, we pick some scapegoat, someone who represents the value we don't have or the values we disagree with. And we like to see a smart person on our side, show them that we like it. So we got to train ourselves out of that because it doesn't help. Yeah. The best humor is when you can laugh at yourself without identifying with your afflictions. When you see your own absurdity and you're like delighted to have finally figured out why you keep hurting yourself. And you just laugh at your own hypocrisies and inconsistencies. That's, that's the best laugh. And that's, I think, the healthiest, you know, maybe comedians is when they say a universal truth that everyone relates to, and you all laugh together about the human condition. Rather than look at this poor fool, let's tear him apart. You know, even, even if you do laugh, don't you have a little bit of an icky feeling afterwards? Like, yeah, no, that's maybe not what adults should do, <laughs> or children, or anyone. Can you guys hear me okay without the mic? Do you want it or no? Ah, oh, it's all right, but keep it for, for them later. Yeah, we're going to say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Julia, go ahead. You had one. Um, sorry, I'm not sure how to unraise my hand. Oh, okay. Um, one thing I thought about this week too is that so often when I'm like 
reacting and anger. I'm like, oh, it's justice. It's like, you know, it's only asserting what there's like some universal fairness. And it's like, but no, like that's not actually a thing. And I'm just creating like more harm. You know, I, I just realized that I, I have this internal like, but there needs to be justice. And it's like, that just, that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> Well, it, it takes just a little bit of objectivity, you know, to say the things that have worked in the past that were done through anger, they only worked temporarily. And then it created the cause for a cycle of violence to continue. So you might have won the argument through being dominant or through being sarcastic or through being smart and precise or being passive aggressive or whatever your go to angry style is, you might have won and you might have gotten what you wanted. But that anger doesn't just go away, it plants a seed in your mental continuum. And then the conditions you created as well in this life are gonna probably come back around and pick any part of the world where there is conflict and say, oh, the conflict's just about what's happened in the last five years. No, <laughs> what, okay, 10 years ago, no. 100 years ago, no. 1,000 years ago, closer. You know, like, where did it start? Who was the bad guy? We just take turns being the bad guy. So we just kind of need to be a little bit more broad view that these short sighted approaches that are effective and satisfying in the immediate, we got to grow out of it. Yeah. And that's not to negate all of the times when it was your only choice, because that's all the mental space you had to try and get some safety or to try and get away from something or to try and move through something. It's not to negate the fact that there were times in our life where we could only be assertive and stick up for ourselves once we got angry. But now that we know there's another way to be assertive, we want to consciously try and retrain ourselves to not need anger to stick up for ourselves. Because then there are no barbs and then there's no boomerang. Yeah. Yeah, Teresa. I, I think that this patient section of the Lom Rim, it's in volume two for those of you that have the, all three volumes of the Lom Rim. This patient section, I read it again and again and again. There's some parts of the Lom Rim I've read once. I like that they're there. I respect them deeply, but I don't keep going back to them again and again. These six perfections, particularly patients, there is, there's a huge amount of just immediately applicable wisdom to untangle a lot of our daily stress, um, how we relate to people, how we relate to ourselves. So we're only doing a couple sessions on patients, but it's actually a huge section. So if you're ever curious, do, do have a look at that in the long run. We're gonna look at um, just a, a kind of some summary stuff of the patients with people, because I think it's useful and we haven't done these particular quotes. Then we're gonna go on to um, physical and mental pain. So it's, it's just as Teresa was saying, basically that if beings had self-control, they wouldn't have any suffering <laughs> because they could control it. So that very lack of control shows us something, yeah? So furthermore, you should stop your anger by thinking, when these beings are moved by strong afflictions, they commit suicide, leap from cliffs, harm themselves with thorns, weapons, stop eating, and so forth. If they do this even to their greatly cherished and dear selves, of course they will hurt others. Right, when people are under the influence of afflictions, negative states of mind, what do they do to themselves, right? Overeat, undereat, yeah. <laughs> Under-exercise, over-exercise. You know, that's just kind of our normal one, like binge on entertainment going into a dissociative state. Scroll for happiness, you know, and, you know, kind of get your eyes all tired and dry. All sorts of things you do to yourself under the influence of afflictions, just to yourself. And you're the one that you're supposed to like the best, yeah? Or at least take care of the most, even if you don't like yourself. This is your go-to thing you're taking care of all the time. So you really relate it to yourself of what are all the ways I hurt myself out of being controlled by afflictions. Everyone else is like this, it just looks different. People do crazy stuff to themselves. Why am I surprised if I cop it sometimes? Because sometimes that does happen, right? When someone is being really terrible to us, we're surprised. You're like, but it's me. <laughs> Right? But you're also surprised, like, 
wait, what? That's a response you could have? But we shouldn't be surprised. Yeah, because they do even worse to them own selves, right? Why do people commit suicide? Why do they do things like self-harm? It's under the influence of delusions and that harm is directed to them. So I know that these things are in a way common sense, but just kind of keep hearing it from more and more angles so that it really influences your everyday behavior. Then we have, um, this example is a very cute Lama Tsongkhapa example, which is when a yak, you guys know yaks, right? When a yak has been saddled up for carrying goods, if the saddle tightens around his tail, he bucks. And then the saddle beats against his legs, right? Hurting him more. If the saddle is loosened, the strap drops and the yak is happy, right? Similarly, if you do not relax around a harm doer, the harm doer matches what you do and you steadily become more unhappy. Yeah, they, you know, yes, neuroscientists talk about mirror neurons, don't they? But this is 14th century Lama Tsongkhapa. Yeah, if you relax, it helps them relax, but not if you tell them to relax, <laughs> right? <laughs> don't tell them to relax. But if you're genuinely relaxed, that has an influence on them. But otherwise it's like, you know, we're kicking because we're uncomfortable and that very kicking makes the same, this, you know, the saddle slap against us. And we are a little bit like this yak. Okay, so patients, when we're harmed by others, when we're harmed bodily or mentally by others, we should not react by getting angry, harming them in return. That's the summary of the whole deal. Um, where do you feel stuck? Or where do you have some new ideas? Because it's not like this is a simple thing, even though it's intellectually simple. Where do you have like a yes, but, 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 crumble? What if when they, what about people who? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, is it, uh, this, this patient, um, does it have a connotation of um, well-being on yourself? Like when, when somebody's acting badly or aggressively at you, uh, mm. you are so uh, kind of Zen attitude that you don't even, like you're so good at yourself and you just emanate the, patientness to all people otherwise if you if you are pretending people know you be, became tense or something and it doesn't work is it is it right yeah yeah don't pretend doesn't work <laughs> if you're if you're worked up don't pretend that you're calm i mean you know don't say anything don't do anything from that place but people know don't they they know when you're being plastic it creeps them out yeah, yeah. don't do it right <laughs> But if you're angry, you know, you don't need to be saying everyone I'm angry and here are the thoughts in my head. Just like zip it. Yeah. Get yourself out of the storm, settle down, enter back into the fray. What you're describing is the ideal case of when you have the perfection of patience. It is actually blissful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we already have a version of this, like when we're with perhaps like, um, a sick animal that we really care about or a child that's having a tantrum where whatever the other thing or other person is doing is really disruptive. Yeah, they're doing a disruptive thing, but you love them so much, you're not rattled by that. You're just like, I got you, I got mm -hmm. you. Yeah, like there's some instance in our life, I think when we can feel that. Maybe it's with your best friend when they're really going through it and they're on a full on rant, but you know how they are with their rants and that they'll come out the other side and chill out and you'll go for a bike ride, it'll be fine, whatever. And so you can hold the space for them and just like hear them out. Of course, there's millions of instances where somebody venting also triggers you and you want them to shut up or you want to add and weigh in or whatever. But I'm talking about the instances where someone else's bad behavior actually triggered a blissful feeling in your mind and it's weird to put it that way but do you know what I mean like when you're caring for something very vulnerable particularly um 
you know, and of course you can only hold that space for so long. Like, so you might be looking after a child, they're having a tantrum, they're throwing things, they're yelling at you, they're saying they hate you. And you're just like, oh, honey, oh, it's a rough day. Yep. And you can really stay in that place for like, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> and then at about 45 minutes, you're like, all right, so I get it. You're suffering, but oh my God, you need to shut up, <laughs> you know, and you start to slowly unravel. Right. But think about your ability to hold that space for, you know, 20 minutes or whatever it is where you're really not rattled. You actually feel blissful because you see their suffering and you know that place, but you also see their potential to be free from that. So bearing witness to suffering doesn't destroy you or agitate you because you're holding parallel things. Yeah. Their bad behavior, their suffering, but also their potentiality and the way impermanence works and how it won't always be that way. And you're almost inviting that wisdom to the space that you share with them. And it, that is part of what helps them calm down. If you're just mirroring their suffering and their pain, you can get really empathic distress and you can get really worn out. And after someone's been in a bad space, you need to like go recover and you feel like they sucked your will to live and you need a nap and a snack and you know, something. That's empathic distress. That's not compassion fatigue because there is no such thing as compassion fatigue, but there is empathic distress. So we just wanna be really careful when we're working with compassion and patience that we know our limits and that we don't feel bad about ourselves for having 20 minutes in us or 30 minutes in us, because it's like a muscle that you grow. And part of the way you grow the muscle of patience is meditating, is studying, is having conversations when you're not angry, when you're not angry. When you are angry, don't talk to yourself. Yeah, your analytical mind will turn against you. Don't talk to yourself when you're angry do something physical, do some breath work, do something that's gonna be grounding, but don't engage your analytical mind in the storm of the rage because it will just reinforce your story. Do you feel that true in your experience? You're trying to think your way out of it and you just think your way into it worse? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, so now John, yeah. Yeah, John, go ahead. I had kind of a, an interesting insight, and I wanted to share it with you to see if I was correct. Um, it feels like anger has some kind of value in that when I'm able to sit with it and practice patience, that anger is transformed into like wisdom or, or some kind of wiser state of, of reaction. Is that how this process is supposed to play out for us? Or I, I guess my question is, is that the result of training the mind, becoming like a wiser, kinder person. Is that the goal? Does that sort of make sense? It's, it's a side effect of the goal. The goal is perfection, okay. including omniscience, which is like gonna take a while. <laughs> <laughs> like in the meantime, yeah, wiser, happier, easier okay. going, more flexible, absolutely. That's what happens. Okay. Um, and so it's like, you know, if you were trying to chase getting wise, and trying to chase being more easygoing and flexible, that's not something you can sort of just tell yourself to be, is it? You can feel yourself getting uptight and grumpy about something if you say, come on, just be flexible, have an open mind, have an open mind. You can't force it. But when you're feeling relaxed, you can reflect on previous moments of being uptight and unpack the false logic that reinforced it. Yeah, and so you're using your memories to kind of notice the patterns of where you get stuck and where you justify something that cannot actually be justified with logic. It can only be justified with emotion and emotion is not wisdom. Emotion is information. We don't wanna pretend we don't have emotions. It's information and sometimes it can have some clarity in there and some useful aspects, but it's really important that we don't go down kind of a you know, forgive me for saying, but kind of a new agey route that just believes if you feel it, it's true, because that is often not the case. And if you just trust yourself, what exactly are you trusting? You know, if, if I trusted everything my mind said to me, I would eat only cheesecake. 
Yeah, it really thinks that that's how I would be happy is I ate only cheesecake. So I cannot trust that voice, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, it's kind of learning which parts are clarity, which parts are distortion. And all of the, it's all kind of mixed together and alternating. And then it can make you feel paralyzed. Like, how do I act? Here's all these things I'm learning in Dharma classes. Here's all these things I'm learning from psychology and self-help and whatever stuff. And you're learning so much, but then what do you do with that? And just kind of come back to an affliction is when the mind is unpeaceful. So if there is agitation there, there might be elements of correct observation. There might be elements of truth, but there is huge amounts of ignorance driving that whole thing. So don't make big decisions when your mind is agitated. Let it settle and then return to the topic. So letting it settle is not the same thing as suppression, is it? Yeah. Suppression is going, I shouldn't feel this way. I don't want to feel this way. I'm pretending I can't, I'm not feeling this way. Squish. Yeah. Letting it settle is going, oh, that's a wave. All right, we're going to have to let that crash over me. Whew, brace yourself. This is a bad one. Yep. And it's done. Yeah. So gently, gently. Okay. So patience when we're suffering, okay. Um, are, is, are we ready for patience when we're suffering? Or do you have bits about humans? Yeah, you have a human bit? Okay. <laughs> yes. They are problematic, the humans. On this expression, uh, compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue, yeah, this expression. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, it doesn't exist. Empathic distress exists, but true what compassion can't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Empathic distress is just feeling with the suffering. Of course, you'll get tired. Of course, you'll get overwhelmed. Compassion is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, which sounds like a sweet cliche, but what it really means is that you can see suffering and its causes and see the potential for freedom. And that's why you don't get tired, right? If you hold the potential for someone's freedom from suffering, their potential for Buddhahood, then you don't have that tension of, I need to fix this. I need to stop this. I, I don't want them to feel this. This is a lot. You, you don't have that same pressure, yeah? So compassion absolutely sees suffering, but it's not only seeing suffering. And it's also not identifying the person with their suffering. It's a much more spacious mind. And it is like that mind of when you're with a little baby who's crying and crying and can't sleep, you don't like the sound of the crying. You know, you don't like the way it's, it, you don't like the way they are like that. You really don't want them to be in that space, but you know that they will not always be crying. And you know that it's not like in the essence of a human to cry their whole life forevermore. And so you can hold the space for them with compassion for, you know, 20, 30 minutes until your focus wears out. And it turns into just kind of straight empathizing of, I feel that you're suffering. I hope that you're free from it, but I don't really have belief in the freedom anymore. I want you to be free of your suffering, but I, I've lost the belief. <laughs> I need this to end now. I'm tuckered out. Yeah. So it's partially our lack of being able to concentrate for long periods of time, which means our good, kind heart of compassion starts to kind of denigrate into empathy, which is a good skill, and then into I need to fix this, it's too much, and then overwhelm, irritation, depression, rage, whatever your style. So basically, you just, then you get to this point, you just walk away. Well, what you do next is up to you and it's got to make sense given your life because, you know, if you're the parent of the screaming baby, you can't be like, well, your time in 20 minutes is up. Sorry, kid. Doo -doo -doo. You know, I mean, many of our parents did and here is our society today. But, um, you know, so you have to do what makes sense. But it's a lot of it is about pacing. You know, if, if you're going to have a hard conversation with someone, don't have two hard, hard conversations in the same day. Give yourself breathing room. Unless you've built up your strength and you're on a roll and you're like, let's get all the hard conversations out of the way today. Who's up next? You know, so you have to know yourself. It's pacing. It's pacing. Yeah. Yeah, Tenzin, go ahead. I was wondering, um, so, so let's say I got mad. I got mad at someone and then I worked my way through uh, getting to a calm state where I'm not angry anymore and I don't want to 
gouge this person out anymore. I just want to, I'm, I'm okay. I'm settled down. Is, would this be a good time to maybe practice the four opponent powers or what would the, uh, the countermeasure, uh, what kind of countermeasure would you recommend applying uh, to maybe, uh, maybe let's say I did overreact and maybe I lash out on someone. And then I'm here with my thoughts saying, oh, he deserved it, she deserved it. And I'm trying to analyze, uh, but let's say I came to a resolve and, and, and the anger shifted away and now I'm in a calm state. So then, would because I, I feel like it could be a good time to you know practice the four opponent powers. Um, yeah, yeah, to purify the negative karma of having gotten angry. Yeah, absolutely, it's a good time to practice the four opponent powers. Um, part of the four opponent powers is the remedy. And that is that, you know, usually it's a visualization with Vajrasattva on the crown of your head, white nectar flowing down, flushing you clean, that remedy plus the mantra. That part can actually have a very powerful energetic effect to shift that kind of grumbly feeling when you get, you know, you're not angry anymore, but you still have a little like woundedness. You know, like you took a hit, like something happened and you're not wanting to hurt them, but you're still a little like, ouch. Yeah. The, that remedy purification visualization really helps. So, so John was asking, can you quickly review the four opponent powers? So that's, it's from the ethics section and it's basically the way to prevent your negative karma from fruiting or sprouting into suffering. So you're basically how to burn your karmic seeds. How do you burn your karmic seeds? So you connect with your spiritual refuge. That's the first, connect with that, which really is you lost your spiritual refuge. That's why you acted out. Yeah, so you reconnect with your spiritual refuge and then you generate the mind of regret. That's the second one. And generating the mind of regret is seeing a fault to be a fault, clean, clear. Yeah, not with, therefore I'm bad, or here's all the reasons why, or here's all of my excuses, or here's all my self-punishment. It's just a really clean, clear, speaking from that place is not the path that I want to be on. I slipped off my path. I missed the mark. For a million reasons, I don't have to feel I'm at fault. I just need to feel the responsibility. So you just keep coming back to, it's not my fault, it's just my responsibility. It's not my fault. It's just my responsibility. Then you can have this regret that goes, that behavior was a mistake. And it's not, it doesn't hurt you to say that to yourself. It doesn't hurt you to be honest because you're not overly identified with it. And then remedy is the third opponent power. And that's that visualization with light and with mantra. But if that's not your style, you just do something that's the opposite of your mistake. You know, if you spoke out of anger, find a reason to speak from love on purpose. It's counter energy, yeah. And then the last part is the resolve. And that's a promise you make to yourself under the gaze of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but it's really a promise you make to yourself about how long can I genuinely stop doing this? You know, so if it's something like harsh speech and it's something that's a big habit in your life, don't say I'll never do it again. Because that's not fair to give yourself that kind of pressure. You're going to forget in a week and say something harsh and then beat yourself up and feel like you're a terrible person and a lost cause and go down the rabbit hole of despair. Just say tomorrow until lunch, no harsh speech. Yeah. And maybe after lunch, because usually then sleepy, so less talky. Yeah. Oh, maybe two. Yeah, two until two. No harsh speech until two tomorrow. And you repeat it to yourself and you check, is that possible? Yeah, it is. Okay. No harsh speech until two. And then two rolls around and you think, yes, karmic seed purified, done, tick. And I know it sounds a little bit formulaic and it's, it is formulaic for people that haven't realized the emptiness of inherent existence directly. That's the quickest way to purify, but that is a huge philosophical beast to try and tackle. In the meantime, just use the four opponent powers. It's the best way to purify negative karma but it's also a really helpful psychological tool to change negative habits. So whether you do it right after like your anger has settled, Tenzin La, or whether you do it just every day at the end of the day, really chill, quiet, in your favorite armchair, just kind of sit and think through the day. 
yep breakfast friendly to people got stuff done feeling good about that oh 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 morning tea oh i went on a whole rave about politics and a lot of it was divisive not helpful okay yes politics morning tea that was a problem you know and you just kind of go through the day but you're also thinking many points throughout the day i was a benefit to people or i was kind to people i offered support to people and that's positive karma and rejoicing in it strengthens it yeah so we can strengthen positive karma and we can diminish negative karma just by thinking through our day at the end of the day it's like watering the seeds yeah so you know the antidote to anger is patience meaning you can prevent it by thinking about these logics we've been talking about and then you'll eventually you'll forget right and you'll have an angry moment but hopefully it will be less frequent it might be as bad as it ever was or maybe if your concentration is also developing you'll catch it sooner and you won't let it go as long but you're just kind of giving yourself really healthy mental food yeah and really healthy mental food which is the correct logic of it actually doesn't ever make sense to wish harm on someone else if i want them to stop being harmful that makes sense but the way to stop them being harmful is not to be harmful back and i was taught that at two years old in preschool and now i'm a grown-up and i should know better by now however part of me still it feels like they should get theirs yeah they will <laughs> right they will get theirs and that's actually really poignant you don't have to be to be the one that waters their seed something else will and that is a little bit heartbreaking but maybe if you give them some space and don't water their negative seeds with your retaliation maybe it'll give them time to grow up you know and maybe it'll give them time to purify their own negative seeds and maybe they don't have to suffer so much in the future either. And that would be a kind thing to offer humanity. So, you know, being whatever the bigger person, being bigger than your own negative states of mind, don't force yourself to practice it in the heat of the moment and expect radical change. Sometimes that happens, but try in the quiet moments where you feel yourself mildly irritated. Yeah, just mildly irritated and see if you can stop it before it grows and escalates. Yeah, and then gently you can start working with more and more and more. These things get easier with practice. Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. No, can you hear me? I can. I can, thank you. Uh, where does apology sit? Your choice, madam. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah your okay. choice yeah. use your own wisdom because sometimes an apology opens the wound and opens the conflict and does a whole mess of things some cultures uh would prefer you just go to your speak but again come back together and it's better ha ha, ha. i see you new zealand um <laughs> <laughs> right but you know some people really do move forward and, and i see you australia yes i see you british influence <laughs> <laughs> but um you know the, the question is really use your own wisdom like will this person feel better from an apology will they actually feel better do i have a responsibility to help them feel better through my apology and owning my stuff often that is the case and it's really powerful and good to do but don't feel like it's part of the four opponent powers because it really depends on the context doesn't it um, mm. And sometimes we're like wanting to be forgiven for something that they have not yet kind of healed from and it puts a pressure on them and they're not quite there yet. You know, so if you are apologizing, do it in this open ended, no expectation way of you might yeah. not actually feel better after I apologize. Mm. You might not actually forgive me after I apologize. It's just about my exercise of self awareness and taking responsibility. But what you do with that is totally up to you. And so the way to apologize is a whole thing. Yeah, gently, gently. So yeah, your choice <laughs> based on what you Thank think you. is logical. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, but the other piece is expecting an apology, right? <laughs> if you're expecting an apology in order to heal, life will be hard. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. 
and I feel that you already know this. So, um, so then we have patience with suffering and I'll just go through it very briefly, then we'll stretch and then we'll do the meditation on it. Um, so basically when we suffer, we point to something or someone outside of ourselves as the cause. Yes, duh. Um, the immediate reason for our suffering may be something outside, but the deep or underlying cause is our own karma, which is our own doing, which is not our fault and we are not bad, <laughs> okay? But it is our karma, we created the cause for it. And, and I can't say this enough, hear that as empowering. Okay, because otherwise people do horrible things because they are horrible or for no reason whatsoever or because God sent them to punish you or all sorts of reasons, which are really troubling reasons. Yeah, that you don't have a lot of power over, but you do have power over your own karmic causes and conditions. So if you think I created the cause for this, you become strategic about how do I stop creating the cause for this? How do I stop watering, you know, previous causes for this? It makes you a lot more empowered to think this is my karma ripening. Okay, so just make sure you're not identifying with it or thinking that you're bad because of it. Just notice the patterns and stop planting those seeds. Um, so these types, you know, to, to accept suffering, how do you accept suffering? Well, <laughs> you reflect on the good qualities of suffering which is so Buddhist, right? The good qualities of suffering. And then reflect on the advantages of bearing suffering, right? And then it's not difficult to bear suffering with practice. And it all feels really like, that sounds great. Um, and no, uh, no, that's gonna be a little bit beyond me. But I think we already do this when we try and reframe. Yeah, you know, when you're talking with good friends who are up for a process and they help you reframe and see something that you thought was a challenge, they help you reframe it into something that is, you know, now you've decided it's a lesson, now you've decided it's something to use for blah, blah, blah. We already do this a little bit. So we just do it a little bit more intentionally. Um, so what are the good qualities of suffering? They spur you on to liberation, right? Because if you had no suffering, you would not develop the determination to be free of it. Yeah. Remember how much work you get done psychologically when things are going really, really well and everything's smooth. Do you have a lot of growth? Or do you just go, oh, that's a nice, <sighs> right? <laughs> Putting the feet up. But when you get squeezed, it occurs to you, perhaps I need to work on some stuff when you get a little bit squeezed. Um, so without being a little squeezy, it, we, it, we're just, it, we're lazy, let's be frank, yeah, we're a little lazy or a little distracted, um, a little passive about our personal growth, so a bit of suffering is going to nudge you into, oh, whoops, yep, I let some things slide, I could upgrade some things, yeah, um, it has the good quality of dispelling ignorance, arrogance, suffering dispels arrogance, how is that? This is quite a good one. Um, it dispels arrogance because when you're struggling, it's very hard to look down on people. Yeah. Um, if you say, take an example where say generally you manage your finances quite well, I don't know. And you know, you have your good accounts and whatever people do with things like money. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you feel kind of chuffed, like, yeah, I'm a good money manager and you have whatever your, what do people do? Investments, yes. And you have a friend who is just always broke and you feel for them, right? You wish they weren't broke. Your heart goes out to them. But part of you is kind of like, how do you keep getting yourself into this? There's like part of you that is, is looking down. It's not compassion. It's not empathy. It's pity. How did you get yourself into that? You poor bugger, you know, and you're sort of like, yikes, but you know, but is then if you have some sort of financial crisis, you know, the stock market crashed or you invested poorly or you spent the wrong thing at the wrong time, whatever happened, and you're like feeling the pinch of, oh, I did not manage that well. Yikes. Suddenly you're a little bit nicer to your friend who's always, you know, broke. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just a softening. And so that dispelling arrogance can really happen in a lot of ways. It can happen with health. Um, you know, if you've always been healthy and robust and vital, 
sometimes people in your life who have chronic illness or who are not in shape or something, you're kind of like, come on, get it together. How hard is it to eat properly? How hard is it to go for a walk? And you're kind of, and then you have some random health crisis or things start to slide and you're vulnerable, but that vulnerability actually settles you in terms of looking down on others. And then when people are struggling in your life after that, you're like, oh yeah, I know what it's like to be tired like that. Yep, take all the time you need. And you don't have that looking down. Do you know what I mean, you're tracking? Yeah, so suffering dispels arrogance. I think this is a really powerful one. Um, then, you know, causes you to shun sin, which is the most annoying translation, shun sin, what are we? Um, but it means destructive actions, right? So when you suffer, you think, why do I suffer? It's the ripening of negative karma. <laughs> negative karma is from destructive actions. So every time you suffer, you think, oh, this is what comes from negative actions of body, speech, and mind. Perhaps I shall stop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it just kind of occurs to you, right? This is what happens. It's what you get. And the other side, causing you to cultivate virtue right? Or positive actions. So these words, sin and virtue, they're yucky, they're annoying. Don't be distracted by the translator. It just means what is positive and constructive or what is destructive, right? So you're just talking about plus and minus signs, things that help, things that harm. And the main one is suffering helps you produce compassion. That's the big one. So for those who wander in cyclic existence, this is because you've assessed your own situation and you think other beings suffer like this. Yeah. So then you try to train yourself into thinking suffering is a condition that I want, <laughs> you know, and that seems to be going a little too far, but actually there's a way of thinking of it. That's not masochistic. That's not kind of self punishing. That's not being a martyr that says a little discomfort keeps me motivated. Suffering actually helps me relate to others in a way that I wouldn't had I not suffered. And think about the friends in your life who have had easier lives than you. The, one, the friends in your life who have had easier lives than you, then when they meet with suffering, there's less resilience because they haven't exercised that muscle of resilience as much. So something that wouldn't even phase us now, because we've seen it a million times already, they're thrown sideways because it's new. Yeah. So it helps us build qualities. But then when we're with them, when we see them going through stuff, we can actually hold the space. Yeah. Their suffering doesn't freak us out. We don't have like an agitation in response to their suffering. We have compassion because we know what it's like and we can just hold still with it and be strategic with them or be spacious with them or just be kind to them. But it doesn't have that pressure of, I've never seen this before, I don't know what to do. Yeah, so this way that suffering helps you build compassion is a really powerful piece. So um, Shanti Davis says, without suffering, there is no determination to be free. You mind, stay fixed. Yes, a summary of that. And the advantages of suffering, you know, basically after you reflect on previously created only hardship that did not accomplish any of your own or other's aims, you uplift your mind thinking, why am I not bearing a suffering that achieves great purpose? Although I am suffering, how excellent that I have found something like this to do, <laughs> right? So this is kind of like tying into um, what do we normally suffer for? Like we're willing to suffer extra hours at work in order to save up vacation time. We're willing to suffer with exercise because we want, I don't know, a healthy body or we wanna look cute in certain clothes or whatever people exercise. Um, obviously, I don't know why people exercise. I should exercise. Um, but, you know, when you're thinking about, it's actually not like we don't suffer on purpose already. We do suffer on purpose already if we like what it leads to. Do you agree? Like, you might stay up too late if you really like what you're watching or reading. And then you're suffering, yeah? You might sit on an airplane for 20 hours because you're going to go see some people that you love. You know, that's suffering. You do it because you like what it's leading to. 
So we're trying to train ourselves to think this suffering that I'm experiencing now is the very thing that I need for my goal. My goal is enlightenment, but to get there, I need compassion. I need patience. And without these hardships, those links don't get made. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so I need this suffering. This is healthy. This is good for me. This is useful. And you try and do that with that wise mind that doesn't slip into martyrdom or slip into masochism. You're doing it in this healthy way, like an athlete training for a marathon, where you're allowing discomfort, you're pushing it, but not to pain in the sense that you're going to have an injury, physically or mentally. So that again, it comes back to pacing. You might think, okay, this is great stuff. I'm going to meditate on it now for three years. Too soon. <laughs> meditate on it for three minutes. Yes, three minutes, not three years. Build your strength gently, gently. Because if you do it too hardcore, too fast, you're going to, you know, strain something. Yeah, you're going to pop a tendon <laughs> psychologically, you know, so pacing. Um, but these ways of thinking can really change our whole life. So it, it's worth sitting with. Um, and there's advantages in bearing suffering in this example, which is very classic Lom Rim. A man who is to be executed is overjoyed when he's freed from execution by merely having his finger cut off. Right? <laughs> How excellent it would be if similarly, by means of this slight suffering of human hardship, I could permanently dispel the suffering of limitless cyclic existence. So this is a little bit about like, if we were reborn as an animal, we would also be suffering, right? We would have animal conflicts, we would have animal illnesses, we would have all the animal issues, but we wouldn't have the, the ability to study and to practice and to frame our suffering in a way that was useful. It would just be hard, yeah? So it's almost like we were sent to the executioner, but we wound up just losing a finger. We should have that kind of relief with the suffering of a human life. Because if that same suffering happened in the animal realm, we would just be reactive and create more of the same. So the Buddha says in the array of stock sutras, daughter, in order to destroy all afflictions, you should develop a mind that is hard to defeat. This is when he was teaching patience to one of his disciples. So thus you need courage that is very firm and stable. You will not be able to accept suffering with a fragile mind. If you initially develop a significant degree of courage, even great suffering becomes helpful. It is just like the case of warriors entering a battle and using the sight of their own blood to increase their boldness. Yeah. So these are the thoughts of the day. Um, we'll have a little stretch and then we'll do a short meditation. So um, have five minutes and uh, we'll come back. Okay, meditation. And so like always, I'll have the points on the screen, but don't feel like you need to read it. It's just there if you kind of lost the thread, if you get, um, you know, kind of distracted and where are we up to? So if you lose the thread, it's on the screen, but it's totally fine. Just keep your eyes closed if that's best for you. And we'll start with just centering and grounding Get yourself back into your body if you accidentally left. And just feel the weight of yourself in the chair or on the cushion and feel like your mind is coming home to your body. And when you feel ready, you can shift your focus to the breath just for a little bit, letting surface distractions settle.
And if you notice yourself drift or sink, gently disengage and come back to the breath, riding the breath like a surfer rides a wave, relaxed and balanced. Reviving your motivation by thinking that we meditate on patience in order to develop our mind to its fullest potential. And in that way, being of most benefit to all sentient beings. And go ahead and let yourself remember what is a little bit hard right now. Physically in your body, if there are aches and pains or illness. Mentally, if there's some stresses and worries. And just with a little bit of objectivity, not falling into the story of your pain, just let yourself acknowledge there's some difficulties right now some things that you wish weren't the case. What are they? And let yourself acknowledge that you wish these pains weren't the case. These stresses, these worries, they do feel like a little bit of an obstacle. Somehow preventing some happiness or something you want to get done. There's resistance in your mind to these physical and mental sufferings. And this resistance makes the suffering worse. It doesn't actually free up space to make solutions or make peace with it. And so to settle your resistance, you just gently move your mind to analysis and think about a good quality of suffering is that it spurs you on to liberation. Because if you had no suffering, you would not develop the determination to be free of it. Suffering is like a catalyst for seeking deeper wellness, increased health, more wisdom, So what does your mind do with that idea? Do you agree or disagree? Does it resonate? Just explore your own response to that idea. 
that suffering can be a catalyst for seeking wellness, or it can spur us on to liberation. And then think about the good quality of suffering is that it dispels arrogance. This is because when suffering strikes you, it reduces your sense of superiority. So has that ever been the case for you in your past? That it was actually a good thing. Your pride took a hit when there was a bit of a struggle. It somehow made you a bit more human a bit more accessible, a bit more relatable. Might have even helped you relax, not needing to maintain some facade. And suffering has the good quality of causing us to turn away from negative actions because we realize our suffering is the result of our negative actions. So that very pain and that very worry becomes like a mindfulness bell that wakes us up, reminds us this is why we must maintain ethics, the ethics of non-harmfulness because we don't want to suffer, because we don't want to hurt others. And the other side is that it helps us cultivate good qualities, positive actions. We know that our happiness and our resources and our positive connections, these are all results. They're effects of previous behavior. And so we want to create more of these causes and less of what prevents it. And most important is that suffering has the good quality of producing compassion for those who wander in cyclic existence. Because we've assessed our own situation, we think, right, others suffer like this too. May they be free of that suffering. Is there a way to think yourself into the conclusion 
that suffering is actually a good thing, something you can even want to have, something you find useful, making you more courageous, robust, open-hearted. See if you can think your way into that conclusion without forcing it, just gently explore. Can I reframe my struggle? And so think all of the energy you put into these thoughts of patience, may they go into the perfection of patience, as well as all of the perfections. And that this takes the form of Om Mani Padme Hum, the Compassion Wisdom Mantra. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 Om Mani Padme Think that the mantra reverberates within you and radiates out, ripening the seeds of compassionate wisdom in both yourself and others. May the precious jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay. So thanks everyone. And um, have a nice little sit with that. Thank you so much, Venerable Yankton.